Hello everyone and welcome back to the show, another episode of Exploder, just for you, I'm Dan, so let's get back to the topic. In a previous episode, I dealt with people that worked for all three companies, the WWF, WCW, and ECW in the 90s. What I realized after making that list was there's so many more that I didn't get around to mention, and I know the episode's about a half hour long, but there are some guys that just didn't meet, they met the criteria with the native time, because I didn't want to be talking for an hour, hour and a half about everyone. So with that in mind, I'm going to do a little bit of a repeat. Pete, a dose, a sequel, if you will. Let's talk about the three Peters that worked for the WBF, WCW, and ECW in the 1990s. I'm going to start it off with a very kind of surprising one if you really think about it Road Warrior Hawk. Now, the Road Warriors of course were a mainstay of the NWA, Crockett Promotions even spent a little time in the AWA They would come to the WBF surprisingly in 1991. They'd be there from 1991 to 1992. They'd bring Paul Ellering with them. Paul Ellering would be given a uh, dummy for some damn reason Don't know. I'm not on the kind of drugs that it takes to write that idea. They would of course leave and during this time the team would seemingly break up with Animal sort of fading out and Hawk continuing to wrestle, both in New Japan with uh, Kensuke Sasaki, who he would christen Power Warrior, and then Hawk himself would appear in ECW from 1992 to 1993. Just Hawk, though. It wasn't the Road Warriors, Hawk and Animal. It was just Hawk. So it was really interesting. This was early, very early ECW. It was still Eastern Championship Wrestling as it was, but I'm going to count it because it's my list. The team itself would get back together in 1995, BNWCW from 1995 to 1996. Do pretty well. Well, working against um, the Steiners and Harlem Heat, Lex Luger and Sting, and the like. Then in 1996, they would leave and go back to the WBF for, at first, what was considered a nostalgia run. They still had a good run in them. It wasn't like it was complete gimmick, but they came back with the same shoulder pads, the same look, and all of that. That would go for a little while, and then Vince McMahon, after bringing them back, decided no one knew who the Legion of Doom was. So, they put them with Sonny, put them in some weird gear, and made them L. D2000 because they were going with the old famous absolutely never failed system of adding 2000 to a name to make them successful right techno team 2000 yeah remember that was a thing putting them with Sonny who they didn't really like and honestly can't blame them and then of course they made they made draws a member and Hawk an alcoholic which was again another sure sign of success they of course would leave in 1998 because well Hawk was pushed off the Titan Tron and they realized wow this is ridiculous Let's, let's get the hell out of here. And you can't blame them. Roy Warrior Animal, of course, would go back to WCW in the late 90s and early 2000s because Johnny Ace was there and he was the mystery man in the Magnificent Seven, a group I've covered in a previous episode. If, you, if you're interested, go check that one out. Another one that might surprise people is Mr. Hughes. Mr. Hughes, Curtis Hughes, was in WCW from 1990 to 1998. He has a really general idea. He wore regular clothes, a uh, button-up shirt, a tie, a top hat. Or not a top hat, but a hat. You know, top hat would have made it more interesting. And sunglasses. He looked like a third-rate Street Fighter character. And he was sort of a bodyguard type named Mr. Hughes. The WF would pick him up in 1993, and he would become just another body in a group of, well, a bunch of bodies. In 1993, he would go to ECW. He worked from ECW from 1993 to 1996, where he famously got into an argument in the ECW locker room one time because, and I'm quoting here, I beat Lex Luger. Uh, no one include Mr. Cur- Mr. Hughes in the fact that the business is a work, so maybe he thought he really did beat Lex Luger. I don't know. In 1997, the WF brought him back to be a short-term bodyguard for Triple H before they eventually replaced him with China, which became much more successful, and they'd bring him back a second time in 1999 to be the bodyguard for Chris Jericho. So this guy had three runs in the WF in the 90s, being someone's bodyguard. One time as a wrestler, and two times as someone's bodyguard that was really short. But he worked in all three companies during this time. Again, not, uh, you know, for what it was, not the greatest wrestler, but nothing to sneeze at. Another one that's been up and down the pike for a hell of a career, and t- quite frankly, some people are still talking about him today, Marty Jannetty. Marty Jannetty, of course, with with Shawn Michaels as the Midnight Rockers, the AWA, traveling up and down the roads and the territories, eventually made their way to the WF, but famously had a tag match, were fired the next day because of something that's supposed happened in a bar with Jimmy Jack Funk, so on and so forth. They would go back to the AWA and then they would come back to the WWF where they would last from 1988 and Janetti himself would last until 1993. Janetti would be on and off with the company for 
For a few years, uh, failing drug tests, getting fired, getting hired back again, failing another drug test, getting fired, getting arrested, so on and so forth. But he'd work for the WF intermittently during this time, in and out. And sometimes coming back to angle with Shawn Michaels, sometimes coming back to team with Leaf Cassidy. I'm going to go ahead and give you a second to guess which one was more successful. Exactly. Very shortly in the middle of all this, he actually did work some shots for ECW, again, very early on in the promotion, but it counts. And then he would end up doing job work in WCW from 19. 97, actually up through the late 90s. He was a guy, you know, usually on the B and C shows. And I remember they would bring him in and he worked Raven, that job to Raven, or they'd bring him in on a worldwide or Saturday night, have him do some job work. But he was also featured, again, he made money. He was on contract. I'm sure he made okay money for what he was doing. But again, unlikely, but still a guy who had worked in all three companies. And it's pr- I think that's pretty interesting. Another one that's going to surprise the hell out of people is Jake the Snake Roberts. Now, Jake the Snake Roberts is just like many of them I mentioned before, a product of the territories who were around long before Vince McMahon started running through the country and picking the talent he wanted like flowers in a field. But his main claim to fame, of course, came to the WBF in the late 80s. Jake Roberts came in in 87, 86, 87. He'd worked for the company up until 1992. He would then leave and go to WCW under the uh, famous Bill Watts era. He immediately, he got signed under the previous administration. Then Bill Watts comes in, Jake Jake Roberts walks in the door and Bill Watts immediately cuts down his deal. Cuts his money and basically doesn't push him. So he immediately cuts him off the knees. And uh, it went about as well as you'd expect. He would then return to the WF in 1996 doing a born again Christian gimmick. And again, I don't know how much of this was true and how much of it was just a good gimmick. I don't know. Damien and even Lucifer, his previous snakes, were replaced by a giant uh, albino python named Revelation. And he was playing like the born again former alcoholic, Bible-thumping, Christian type, uh, indirectly gave rise to the Austin 316 phrase because Jake Roberts was legitimately quoting scripture and things like this. It didn't help that he came in with like a beer gut from all the years of being Jake Roberts and the fact that, well, while he claimed to be a sober Christian, uh, there's arguments to be made that he was neither one of those. So, really helped. Didn't really help the gimmick. 1997, at Hardcore Heaven 97, ECW's second pay-per-view, he interfered in the Tommy Dreamer Jerry Lawler match. Really a short thing. Came in, uh, DDT Tommy Dreamer. Did a little uh, thing into the camera about God giving and taking away, so on and so forth. Then left, collected his money, and out of respect for him now, I'm not going to guess what he did with the money, but uh, I think you could probably guess on your own. He would then come back in 1998 to team with Tommy Dreamer because, you know, ECW time passes and all that, in a Dream Partner tag match. And again, actually wrestled a match and you know I'm sure it was halfway decent it's Jake Roberts even Jake Roberts drunk was still better than a lot of the guys sober so yeah just really and I think that's very interesting for I mean of all people Jake Roberts worked all three companies and, and was prominent had a, had a decently prominent role in all three this one I, I think I'm cheating a little bit I, I know previously in the other list I mentioned I wasn't gonna do job work if I went job work I, everybody worked everywhere for the most part I mean even there were some ECW guys like Jason Knight who worked job stuff in the uh, WF I mean at the time if you go through the WF archives and the Raw archives especially, you'll find all kinds of ECW guys doing like really easy job work against, you know, the Warlord or Coco Beware or whatever gimmick uh, Mike Shaw had that week. I don't know. But this one, only because of how prominent the guy became, I'm going to sort of break the rules a little bit. But Rob Van Dam. Rob Van Dam started as Robbie V in WCW in the early 90s alongside... Of course, Raven, who was Scotty Flamingo, Scotty the Body, you know, so on and so forth. He wouldn't last long, but he had a decent look and did his martial arts stuff. And you saw the Van Damme thing very quickly, the Jean-Claude Van Damme look. You saw it. You'd go to ECW to join up with Sabu, the nephew of his trainer, the original Sheik. The the original Sheik, know the difference. If you don't know the difference, go read up on it. During this time, he would start appearing on Monday Night Raw. Around 1997, he would appear on Monday Night Raw as part of this East, sort of this quasi-ECW contingent, although he was brought in by Jerry Lawler, who was anti-ECW. So, Rob Van Dam became Mr. Monday Night. And he would take this gimmick now after a incident where they wouldn't let the real Double J, Jesse James, job to Rob Van Dam because politics and all that, and end up being a count out or something. The Mr. Monday Night thing in the WWF really faded away and it really last. He had a couple matches with the Hardy Boys back when they were still jobbers and things like that. But his actual push or his idea bringing him in full time sort of disappeared after the fact that he couldn't beat uh, 
pre-road dog. And but he would go back to ECW and keep the Mr. Monday Night name and, and really just play up the WF connection because that was a great way to get heat back then, and it was brilliant. And that's where he left it, it, most of his time. And of course, when ECW folded, he and Tommy Dreamer came over to the WF and joined, and were there for many years after. But even in, even in this time frame, he still was able to manage to work in all three. He wasn't featured really in ECW. He was he was featured very shortly in the WF, but he was featured mostly in ECW. But really, those last two sort of worked together in a symbiotic relationship to make a character. He wasn't Mr. Monday Night as far as the WF was concerned because they weren't going to use him, but all he had to do was show up on TV and then show up in ECW with a Monday Night Raw shirt and, and it was brilliant. It just absolutely brilliant and, and it worked really well. Another one that might surprise some people is Sherry Martell. Sherry Martell, Sensational Sherry, Sister Sherry, Scary Sherry, whatever you want to call her. Sherry Martell, of course, was a product again of the territories from back in the day where that was a real thing. She would go to the WBF and she would manage, again, only top guys. She managed Macho Man Randy Savage. She managed Ted DiBiase. And she would go from Ted DiBiase to Shawn Michaels. That's why when Shawn Michaels' first manager being Sensational Sherry, that was kind of a big deal because she only dealt with top guys. She wasn't managing, you know, Brooklyn Brawler version 2. She only managed top guys. So when she went to Shawn Michaels, that was a big deal. She would eventually leave the WF, I believe around 93, maybe early 94, after working with, uh, she would work with Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels would turn on her. She would manage, or kind of managed to tonk at WrestleMania 9 and Shawn Michaels would bring in Luna Vachon who I've talked about before she would then go to ECW where she would be a manager for a very little bit and then get picked up by WCW and WCW is where she spent the rest of her time from 1994 where she was of course working with Ric Flair and she was famously in that cage match with Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan and all that mess that was going on and she was there she ended up managing Harlem Heat with Colonel Parker they had like a thing where she hit her head and then fell in love with Colonel Parker so on and so forth but again she was a great talent and a great manager and she was great at what she did and again she worked for all three companies and had a great role in all of them so you got to give it to Sherry Martell for just that reason this one I covered on a previous episode uh it's very interesting I, I've talked about it a little bit so I'm, I'm just going to gloss over it real quick because I covered it more in the in a previous episode Rick Root Rick Root of course was a WCW WF guy really he started the WF in the 80s and he would be there until 92 he would leave the WF WF and go to uh, go to WCW where he would become be, be a top guy. I mean, clearly he was like the world champion. He was a top guy in the company, and then he unfortunately would suffer a career-ending injury. And they really didn't know what to do. They couldn't wrestle anymore. And it was, so it was years before he really did anything. And then uh, the time came that Shawn Michaels kept talking about an insurance policy. The formation of DX. He started talking about an insurance policy, insurance policy, insurance policy. And then he brings in Rick Rude, who now has short hair. Because if I remember Rick Rude from the 80s, they remember Rick Rude with the long hair and the big porn stash and everything that made a guy named Rick Rude look like a guy named Rick Rude, if you know what I'm saying. Well, now his hair is short. His mustache is still pretty porny but a little little trimmed out, little 90s, good for him. And the joke about the insurance policy was the reason Rick Rude wasn't wrestling was because he his injury activated a Lloyds of London insurance settlement. And the insurance settlement, which I remember, if I remember correctly, Kurt Henning had one very similar, which is why he didn't start wrestling again until 1997, though he was out of the business for a couple years before that, is the condition of the insurance settlement was you have to stop wrestling. You can't be in the ring and collect the insurance, and the insurance money he was collecting was just too good. So sort of this albatross on him, why he couldn't get in the ring. So that was the joke of him being an insurance policy for Shawn Michaels, of sort of an inside joke. But he was able to do both, but he was also on a per night deal, which again, I've talked about being part of him showing up on Raw and, and Nitro on the same night. Now, during his time in the WF, he also worked in ECW. He was working with Shane Douglas being his mentor, finding him opponents because Shane Douglas was the ECW heavyweight champion at the time. And sort of that mentor type thing, and of course he turns on and bam bam big one wins the belt Shane Douglas wins it back and that whole thing and of course like I've talked about in the previous episode he ended up on Raw and Nitro on the same night and he ended up on ECW that same week because of the taping schedule so this guy again not only appeared on all three programs uh, for all three companies through that decade he would appear at that point all three all three times in a week all three shows in a week and then he would continue in uh, WCW uh, from 1997 late 97 up but unfortunately until his death in 1999 so uh, you know I mean, it's not a good way to end it, but I mean, that's the facts, you know. This one's going to surprise the hell out of people. This one, I didn't know about this one. I had to 
look this one up, but Jimmy Del Rey. If you don't know who Jimmy Del Rey was, and I know I say that a lot, but I'm not going to make fun of Jimmy Del Rey. Jimmy Del Rey was a member of the Heavenly Bodies with Dr. Tom Pritchard. I don't know what Tom Pritchard's a doctor of, but he's a doctor. The doctor of love is what they used to say. I don't know if that's a degree or... I don't even know what you'd even call that. Anyway, Jimmy Del Rey worked for the WF, Smoky Mountain, as part of the Heavenly Bodies with Tom Pritchard, managed by Jim Cornette. Yes, every time you say Jim Cornette in the distance, you can hear Mother Effer echo in the, in the countryside. I know I do. Anyway, the WF thing with the Heavenly Bodies wouldn't last that long. He would then go to ECW, work there for a bit, and then eventually end up in WCW as Jimmy Graffiti. Yeah, I don't remember Jimmy Graffiti either. I have a vague memory of what he was. He was a jobber, did BNC shows, jobbed everybody. But he had to actually retire in 1997 due to a knee injury. So in a period of, I think, three years, four, 1994 to 97, so three years, he worked for the WF, ECW, and WCW. So he did it in a compacted time, and, uh, you know, he's never a big star in any of them, but, he, you know, he made money. Speaking of bigger stars, Conan. Conan started in the WF in the early 90s as Max Moon. Max Moon was supposed to be, like, this Japanese robot thing, but by the time it actually made it to, uh, made it, well, by the time it made it to TV, it was Paul Diamond, but by the time it actually made it to a ring, it went to, like, this multicolored Power Rangers, got really sloppy in the back seat with one of the, uh, Planeteers from Captain Planet, and, uh, uh, you ever remember the 1996, the the, the little um, mascot, who's it, whatever the hell they called it? Remember that? The weird thing? It was like blue body and had rings on its tail, and no one knew what the hell it was. It was so unpopular that it didn't actually show up at the games. I'm getting really obscure here, but yeah, that that's what his suit looked like. It had multicolored bands and stuff. I don't know. Anyway, Conan was that for a very little bit, but he had to carry these cartridges that shot like flames and things, and he was making more money in Mexico. He did it for a little bit, but before it actually made TV, he left the company, apparently burned some bridges and got a lot of heat with WB that existed for, well, probably till today. He would then go back to Mexico, eventually working his way into ECW. While in ECW, he would get the call to come up to WCW. Now, when he came to WCW, he was promised, if you believe the stories, he was promised a Hulk Hogan, Conan match that was going to be like this superpowers thing, because Conan actually was at the time really over in Mexico, like insanely over. So there was this idea that Hogan was going to be the biggest star in America, and Conan was going to be the biggest star in Mexico, and they were going to collide and I don't know who said that, and I don't know who believed that, but he ended up being like a second string member of the Dungeon of Doom, and that is not even remotely close to what he was promised. But you know, it was WCW, you know, they sent paychecks to people that never worked for him. So at that point, can you really be surprised they do anything? I'm not. When you think of WWF mainstays, one name that'll always come to mind is Jim the Anvil Neidhart. Jim the Anvil Neidhart have numerous stints in the WWF, of course, coming in at the at the fall of Stampede Wrestling, his father-in-law's promotion with brother-in-law and tag team partner Bret Hart. He would come in back and forth, eventually returning. Uh, Bret Hart and him would split. Bret would become a single star, and Jim Neidhart would team with Owen and wear some of the gaudiest stuff the 90s ever produced. Oh, dear sweet Jesus. MC Hammer would be caught in these pants, and that's saying something. He would then leave and then come back later, teaming with Owen Hart against the British Bulldog and Bret Hart in sort of a family feud that continued the Bret Owen storyline, which admittedly was really good. And then in 1996, he would come back as Who. Now, that isn't me guessing uh, or asking you a question. His name was Who. They took Jim Neidhart and his furry self, let's put it nicely. They put him in a generic lucha mask, and they called him Who. So that the announcers could go, Who's in the ring? That's right, Who. The Abbott and Costello routine from 60 years ago. Because somebody, Vince, somebody thought it was funny. So, that was a thing. Although, early, in, in the middle of this, while he was in between runs in the WF, he actually had a couple matches in ECW. Like many people did, including the British Bulldog, including Jimmy Snuka, Don Morocco, and the like. Again, short run, but it counts. Of course, he go back to WF, and then after Montreal, he would go to WCW. And he would join British Bulldog, leaving in a huff after what happened to Brett you know, after Montreal. And of course, well, he was Jim Neidhart. So he eventually come back to the WBF. Didn't do a whole lot. I mean, his, most of his time was really spent with the Hart Foundation in some form or another. That was his big thing. But he actually did work in all three companies. Another one that's going to surprise the hell out of some people. If you don't know who it is, it really look this guy up because he had his problems, but he actually was very, very talented. Matt Bourne. 
Matt Bourne started in WCW in 1991 as Big Josh. It was a lumberjack gimmick. He was from the Seattle, Washington area, Portland, Oregon area. And he started there. And he ended up being Big Josh in WCW. He actually came to the ring at some time with two bears. It was a whole lumberjack thing. I don't know. It lasted for a year, 1991, 1992, when anything flew in WCW. He would then go to the WF in 1992 as the original Doink. Now, if you've actually seen the other Doink, if you've seen Doink as Ray Apollo or Steve Lombardi or whoever the hell they put in the thing, and they made when they made him a baby face and put him with uh, Tiger Jackson, who was Dink and all that stuff, you didn't get the real Doink. That was the gimmick. That was the guy he put on commercials and video games. The original Matt Bourne Doink was amazing. 1992, 1993, he came in as a heel. He was a heel clown. And he looked like he does. He looked like Doink always looked. That was the gimmick. The the green curly hair, the whole thing. But he would play pranks on fans and wrestlers as a clown as a heel. And it had this dark undertone to it that was actually as goofy as the WF was in the early 90s and would continue to be through the mid-90s. Um, this was actually a, a stroke of brilliance. And I, I like the original Doink. And, of course, Matt Bourne himself would get fired uh, due to drug problems. And they would take the Doink character because it was basically a wig and face paint and a bodysuit and give it to someone else. Someone else. There was like 50 people played Doink. And he would go to ECW as as himself, as Matt Bourne. He would show up. I remember the, fir- the first time he showed up in ECW in 1994, he showed up as Doink. He wore the full Doink gear. And this is the rabid ECW crowd. The ECW crowd hated Doink. It was the antithesis. Because by this point, Doink had already turned babyface. So it's him and the and the and the, you know and Dink and they're facing Bam Bam Bigelow and Luna Vachon and all these things. It's so gimmicky and hokey. And those fans, the fans that were in ECW that were like they were likely to leave ECW, go to a bar, drink next to the Sandman, go get into a street fight, you know, go back to the ECW arena, try to break in, and so on and so forth. Those types, they didn't want to see Doink. But the brilliance of this, the brilliance, and I don't know if this was Matt Bourne himself or this was Paul Heyman, I don't know, but this was still brilliant. They had him eventually turned to the point where he would wear the, the doink gear and he would paint half his face with the doink makeup and half his face not. And then he wouldn't wear the wig. And he'd put the wig on his opponents. Like, he would try to make them into the cartoon character, which made it even greater. Um, and he was like, it was like this guy, it was his hair is straggly, his blonde straggly hair, and he was like, it was what you were seeing was a guy slowly being driven insane. Like, he was doink, and it drove him nuts. So you see this wrestler, he was called Born Again, and it was this guy sort of slowly, like, fading in between doink and Matt Bourne, and the guy was just slowly going nuts. And it was the perfect ECW gimmick. It was a great gimmick, but it didn't last because, of course, again, Matt Bourne got in trouble for drugs. And now, keep in mind, to get in trouble for drugs in ECW, they employed the Sandman, Raven, Perry Saturn, New Jack, Rob Van Dam, and Sabu. Full time. Yeah, yeah. They employed those people, and Matt Bourne got fired for drug issues. There's something bad going on there. He was doing something that they hadn't even discovered yet. Like, he was digging, like, like prototype meth. I don't know what he was doing, but that guy, for him to get fired, was amazing. Unfortunately, of course, as somebody who does a lot of drugs throughout his life, unfortunately, Matt Bourne's no longer with us. But, uh, again, all joking aside, a very talented guy. And I-, I would suggest you look at the early doink. The early, early doink when he was still a heel. And you look at some of the stuff, if you're on the network, look at some of the, the Born Again stuff. Because it was just a little, it was a little dab of brilliance. Would it have been the main event? No. But it was just a little bit of a character and it's a little bit of a tweak that fit ECW and was a great gimmick. And it's something, the kind of subtlety that I think still missed. One guy who managed to have a career all around the world, both in the ring, behind the scenes, somebody who was everywhere from, you know, Minneapolis to Tokyo, Jerry Lynn. Jerry Lynn, of course, started in Global up in Minnesota with his amazing match with the Lightning Kid, aka 123 Kid, Cannonball Kid, Sean Waltman, X Pac, Six Pac, Pac Pac, I don't know. But they had some great matches back in the day. He would then go to WCW where they would put a mask on him and call him Mr. JL, you know, Jerry Lynn, JL. Yeah, that was the creative process at the time. Mr. JL. And before they brought in Rey Mysterio, it looked like he honestly was going to be a front runner for the Cruiserweight title. They, they were featuring him on Saturday, Night, uh, Saturday Night's main event. He was on Nitro now and again. And it looked like they were going to feature him as maybe one of the contenders for the Cruiserweight title. And then they brought in Rey Mysterio. And then Rey Mysterio and Dean Malenko were just having such uh, spectacular matches. It made sense to have it be about them. And, of course, according to Jerry Lynn, and I'm not saying he's right or wrong, but according to Jerry Lynn, he was actually 
sort of yelled at at times because he'd go out and as Mr. JL is basically a jobber, low rung cruiserweight type, he would go out there and he would come back and be yelled at for having too good of a match. Which I normally wouldn't say that, but you know what? Being that it was WCW at the time and, and the amount of money changing hands and all that stuff, I wouldn't put it past him, honestly. I could see that. After his WCW run, he would go to ECW where he would become Jerry Lynn. And, and first of all, when he first came in in November, to remember 97, he teamed with Tommy Rogers, which is sort of a weird pairing, you know, Tommy Rogers from the Fantastics. And they had a tag match with Chris Candido and Lance Storm. And then Tommy Rogers sort of went on to his own thing and Jerry Lynn. Jerry Lynn came in as Dynamic Jerry Lynn, which I think is probably the most generic name you can give somebody outside of The Natural. Yeah. Go back and look. Anybody who's ever had the nickname The Natural has usually been uh, not well. Uh, they've not done well. So even Dustin Rhodes, who's amazing. When they called him The Natural, even made music to the effect. Yeah. It just didn't go. The Natural. It doesn't mean nothing. Dynamic Jerry Lynn. That was just, that was a place. Older. He would though eventually go on to a amazing series of matches with Rob Van Dam that people are still talking about, and that would parlay into a job in the WF in 2001. He worked in w- he worked in the WF, become their light heavyweight champion back when that mattered back in the day. The light heavyweight title was sort of on its last legs, but they gave it to Jerry Lynn, and he faced Rob Van Dam in one match in WWF on Sunday Night Heat. That was like 14 minutes, and they clipped it down to six, if I remember correctly. So that was how much time they gave they gave to that that idea. And it was one match. It was just a random off one off match, and it was clipped down for TV, and it was on a B show. And here we are. But yeah, again, this okay. Again, after the WF, he would go on to Ring of Honor and so on and so forth. I mean, but the, in, in the parameters of what I'm doing here, I'm just talking about the major three. But this guy again worked for TNA on numerous occasions. He worked for Ring of Honor on different occasions. He's worked behind the scenes. He's, he's a really talented guy. Um, but a guy who, although not the most charismatic person in the world, uh, the ability to work all three companies in different capacities and be really good at it. I'm going to close with this episode with one that will surprise the hell out of people, honestly. This one, if you had told me this without any video proof, I would have not believed it. Never believed it, but here we are. Dusty Rhodes. Now, Dusty Rhodes, of course, was a mainstay. I keep saying that word, but it's true for some of these guys. Some of these guys are known for being that thing. Jerry Lawler was a mainstay of Memphis. That's what you know him for. Not the place, He didn't go over places, but he was known for Memphis. Right, Dusty Rose was a mainstay in the NWA, NWA champion. He was a booker in WCW, so on and so forth. So NWA, he would go to the WBF in the late '80s. They would put him with a heavy set older woman and polka dots. I'm not sure which one was more embarrassing to his character. He would somehow get that over anyway because he's Dusty Rhodes. He would then go back to WCW, become the booker, sort of getting these little backstage fights with Ric Flair and so on. But he would work there for a while. Then, as 1999, 2000 was approaching. WCW would do the unthinkable and fire Dusty Rhodes. Now, why? I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. He would then turn around and go to ECW and did an actual angle. Matches, bunk count stampede, big brawling matches with Steve Carino in ECW. Dusty Rhodes in ECW. That's that's amazing. I mean, that's the ability for a guy to be an NWA champion in the 80s and be this big star and then go into the become a, book, become a booker, get polka dots over, become an announcer, somehow join the NWO. I don't know what that was about. Then go to ECW and do a bunkhouse match with a guy who's 30 years younger than you. That's amazing. I, I give him all the credit in the world. Dusty Rhodes was amazing, and I have to give him just amazing for that. I, absolutely. I can't, there's no words for that. Just, I just love it. Well, that's going to do it for this time. My name's Dan. This is Exploder. Have a good one. <laughs>